going to get started, guys. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming to see us at noon today. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, we're, we're working on the next uh, few, few see you at noons. We're going to go back. I don't think we're going to go back to 1978, but we're going to try to interview all the former presidents of Korea. Uh, so that means we're, we're going to get Mike Butler on here, who, honestly, guys, you should just write down all of his phrases and everything. I mean, that's one where I'm going to have to give the Korea disclaimer on that these are strictly <laughs> our own opinions. But that's true, too, for this one. These are our own opinions. We obviously can't predict the future or anything like that. Uh, but today's call is going to be really interesting. I'm just going to give you a lot more data and analysis. And then I think it's going to be more just like, you know, spitting the shit and just talking. Um, I've got a lot of data points, or not data, but information that uh, from articles on like bigger pockets and just Googling. But guys, the future is going to be cool. I think we're all actually like in a really interesting situation. We're all going to be, I don't know, we'll be fine. We're in this together. Um, Mike, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, thanks, Rob. Uh, so <clears throat> for those of you that I don't know, I'm Mike Fallett. I'm with uh, MM Lending. We are a private lender and have been in business for about 15 years. We serve primarily the single family fix and flip market with one year traditional fix and flip type of loans where we finance the purchase price and, and rehab and some of the interest costs in some cases. Uh, we operate in three markets, uh, Louisville, uh, Cincinnati, and Indianapolis. Um, and uh, our, our company is myself and Wendy Kays who actually does all the real work here at uh, MM Lending. So uh, appreciate all she does here. Um, so uh, my background, I'm, I'm actually a, an accounting uh, background. I was a practicing CPA for a number of years and I ran a couple of other businesses before we started this business 15 years ago. So, um, and I, I've, I've I'm one of the older guys, like a few of the other folks on here. So have been around uh, and seen some of the market cycles going back to uh, uh, to 1980, and uh, you know wh where we are right now is one of those times where there's a million data points, but it's hard to predict exactly the pathway that we're gonna we're gonna be on. But today, you know, I think we'll get a chance to just give our perspective on on a couple things and see where things are. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, Rob, I know you've got some data that you want to share. Um, and I'm going to just kind of toss it back over to you to kick things off. Well, okay. Uh, I think we should hit yours because I think yours is going to be okay. more lined okay. up and fast and stats. And then the rest right. is going to be like, well, what do you, what kind of effects do we do? Do we think flying cars are really going to have on, on the real estate? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Now I didn't have much on flying cars today, but we can cover that in another session. But, I uh, so I've, <laughs> I've got my screen shared uh, and, and uh, my setup's a little bit different. Can, can you see the, uh, the shared screen I have up on here that shows, um, let's see if I can get it up there, the uh, market forecast for uh, as of March 13th of 20? Yeah, I can see it. That's showing up there, Rob. Okay. So this is just something, it's just, some of you all may have seen this as well, but just to kind of, uh, as a starting point, and you know, we we typically look at at supply and demand as the primary starting point when we're evaluating, as probably everybody does, uh, pricing and making decisions on what we should do. And uh, you know, we're in kind of a unique situation right now in the in the real estate world. And I think this will kind of point it up. Uh, one data point that's not on this chart. Um, is what's called the shortage of housing and uh, by the different estimates but i think forbes magazine in early uh, 2020 estimated about 3. million housing units shortage overall in in the u.s so on the supply demand side there is more demand than there is supply on a macro basis and then just kind of jumping in and looking this is the um, Realtor.com, you know, the original forecast of 5.25 million home sales, they've uh, taken that down to 4.5 million, which you can see is, is less than 2019. And so their forecast for 20 was less than 19 as well. Um, you know, they were, they were originally projecting a, just a slight decrease and now it's a 15% um, home prices. They're actually forecasting those are going to go up, which and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this is an interesting number right here. Single family housing starts. Uh, originally, they projected they'd be up 10%. Uh, 
they're going to be down 11%. So going into a year where there was a almost a 4 million unit shortage, uh, the only way to, to, to uh, change that number on the supply side is to build more property or to convert and rehab properties. And you can see on the housing starts, they're going the wrong direction on those at this time. And then mortgage rates, um, you know, from, from 2019 to 2020, uh, that's a pretty significant drop there, which will, which helps lessen the cost of housing as well. So, um, that's, you know, again, that's, that's national and the national numbers don't really mean a whole lot to us, uh, locally in many cases, cause they're distorted because of the East coast, West coast and the big market impacts. Uh, but let me jump over this chart here. Can you all see that? Okay. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Oops. Let me get my numbers right there. So these are some market stats here from the markets that we operate in um, from the um, MLSs for the, for these markets. But if we just went back and, and, and look at 2020 month versus 2019 month, and again, looking at supply and, uh, and demand. So demand would be in sales and then inventory be in the supply and looking to see what's the what's the the trends in both of those as a re, as as they relate and so you can look and see for uh you know for these three markets sales were down 16 percent for the month of march but inventory was down 24 percent so there's less for people to buy for those that you that may have heard some of the conversation prior to the beginning of this rob said it's kind of a crazy market and that's kind of an indicator of that is that um you know there's less supply out there and and more potential buyers out there there was a couple data points that came out today from Redfin. They track the number of buyers that are in the market by inquiries and appointments and uh, showing that that number is now uh, trending significantly up over pre-COVID uh, numbers. And so it certainly indicates that there is some pent up demand, which is certainly good for short term for selling. The big question is how big is that pent up demand? And that would be the 3.8 million unit shortage how many of those pent up buyers will get eliminated or moved back as a result of the current pandemic situation? And, and where is that going to play out on the timeline? I, you know, we, we don't have any granular forecast for that, but we do expect that it, that that the there will be a decrease in demand at some point. The report from the uh, uh, from the National Realtors Group says that they expect home sales to tick up in in late summer and early fall and then start to tick back down again. So we're gonna see maybe what some might call like a W recovery rather than a, a, a V or, or a U. Um, and then flipping over to April, you can see, you know, uh, sales for, uh, for April uh, picked up, uh, but they're still down from, a, from the prior year. Uh, nationally, sales were down about 17%. And then in these three markets, they were down about 18%. And then inventory down overall in those three markets, about 19%, which was exactly the national level of inventory as well. So you kind of see a little moderation between the supply and the demand there. Uh, median price uh, is up 8% for the same period. It's up 12% for March, up 8% for, uh, for April. Interestingly enough, you know, nationally down 7% for the month of, of, of April. So we're kind of just watching if, if, the, if the supply number changes, if, if everybody that uh, when, they, when they open up the economy, if everybody puts their house on the market, and there's, a, there's a big increase in supply, obviously, that'll impact the, the, um, the, the, the value that people are willing to pay. But right now, that tension between supply and demand is, is holding. And that's just a big question is how long is that going to hold? How much pent up demand is there out there and how, how much will that pent up demand get dinged by continuing degradation of the, uh, of the economy? Um, kind of the other, the third factor we kind of look at is um, the mortgage credit availability index. And this is a, an index that the mortgage bankers association compiles and it's based upon rates and terms uh, in the and in, in availability of funding in the mortgage industry. And this, you, I know you can't really see that if I can make it bigger. Um, this goes back to 2000, 
and 12 is the original date back here. And you can see it's been a pretty steady increase up and then it kind of fell off the cliff here. This is March 1st, this data point, March 1st. Um, so obviously that's a, a critical number. Um, the availability of funding, you may have willing buyers, but if they don't, if they can't get attractive mortgage financing uh, at, at credit terms that meet their situation, they won't be able to buy houses or they won't be able to pay the prices. So this is certainly something to watch. The government has been backstopping a lot of the, the mortgage markets to date, how much, uh, and they and, and they expect that they're gonna continue to do that. Um, it remains to be seen, you know, the one of the premises that, that uh, the markets operate under right now is that uh, the, the US federal government has enough money to backstop everything kind of forever. If you listen to some of the folks in Congress, obviously that's not true. And I think that we'll find out at some point when we start to push this exactly how much can the government fix in this versus how much will they let the markets themselves step in and, and fix. There's always winners and losers in, in that process. Um, so those are kind of the, the data points that we're looking at. And, and what we're seeing just boots on the ground confirms what Rob and, and Chris were talking about before we uh, started this afternoon is that the market is a little crazy. There are uh, uh, properties are selling almost instantaneously for a lot of folks at, at good prices. We have not seen any uh, drops in appraised values. I don't think any of the pre-COVID-19 or post-COVID-19 transactions are, are hitting into the appraisals yet. And, uh, you know, based upon what we're saying, even the post-COVID-19 transactions are going to be additive to the values uh, that we're going to see for, for quite a while. And as long as buyers are willing to pay that, the banks, I think, will, will probably finance that. So we'll continue to see maybe tighten credit standards to make sure that, uh, that it fits for the, uh, for the lender. But the, I don't, we don't see any pressure downward on the values uh, at, at this point. Um, we're assuming in our business model that at some point there will be some downward pressure that there is not enough pent up demand to sustain the market ad infinitum, that there is a fixed number of potential buyers out there who have income credit, uh, and their, their family circumstances, their personal circumstances dictate that they, they need to acquire housing of a certain type, type and place. And, and so at some point we'll see the possibility that there'll be you know, it'll become, you know, less of a, of a uh, seller's market and, and turn into a buyer's market at some point. And we'll see maybe some price deflation, but that's going to be the, the, the story is going to be the battle between the, the, the pent up demand, the, the available inventory and the housing shortage that began at, you know, where we're, from where we started this thing. So it's kind of a, a you know, three-legged stool that we're looking at there. That's a great analogy for it. Um, the, the only the other thing I want to kind of throw out there that I've been reading and Rob, you may have read some of these is, you know, and housing is a little unique in, in, as a um, as an asset class because you can't really move houses. Um, some, you know, I guess if it's a mobile home, you can. But housing is fixed in place. You can move oil. You can move electricity. You can move toilet paper. Uh, you can move almost every commodity that's out there and they're fluid. Housing is not. Um, you really can't move that on the supply side. On the demand side, it can move. And, and some of the things I've been reading is that many of the larger markets are going to see some pressure with some migration out of those markets and that the markets like Louisville, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, the Midwest markets will become very attractive to, uh, to many of these folks, particularly as they, as they start to combine work from home. Um, the, you know, the attractiveness of being in larger markets is losing a lot of its luster. And so, so that's another thing that I think will, it, it, it will hurt the, the bigger markets as their supply and demand imbalance, but the, but the demand side is going to come towards the, um, the secondary markets like uh, a Louisville. So um, I think that's, a, that's a certainly a very, uh, a very positive thing. Well, it's a shame um, we're not in the, you know, on the, in the government's ears, because I think there's a lot of things we could do locally to stimulate the economy that, would greatly benefit the long-term outlook of, of Louisville. I mean, like, just think about like a few things that we could do, you know, they could finally reform the West End properties and we're going to have this huge deficit. I don't know who I was talking to about it, but you know, marijuana, gamble, gambling, 
I think they could change zoning for a lot of things. I mean, I brought it up before, but Oregon changed all their single family to multifamily because their labor force mm -hmm. was so small. So if you change zoning, I mean, think about all the cool stuff we could bring into the downtown area that's like boring stores like insurance right now. Like those places, if they just, you know, I think it'd be cool to move in some more entertaining things into those areas. I mean, if we can get some of those liens that they're never going to collect for taxes in the, in the South End, West End, start being able to turn those property, we can help, you know, be able to fulfill these areas. If they loosen up on Section 8 a little bit more, I mean, that's four things right there that could really just spurn our economy. Uh, yeah. And you got to think the tech stuff yeah. is going to be doing better if those people are migrating out of these big cities like New York and San Francisco and Chicago. Right. Well, you know, and, and as the, a lot of the uh, political leaders, they're dealing with crisis management right now on, on a lot of fronts. And one of the big crises that they're all going to have is on the financial side. The federal government can print money, but the local governments and the state governments uh, can't do that. And, and we are at a disadvantage in Kentucky because of our – uh, our our political system, our, our pension liabilities, we have that we have that same situation here in Louisville. So as revenues fall, all of those are fixed cost. And so um, you know, I, I don't know. The city has very few true variable costs. And so when they talk about balancing their budget, uh, a lot of those cuts are always ex exceptionally painful. And there's some that they you know when they get to the on on the pension side, a lot of the fixed obligations, they don't have any. Uh, room to, to move through those. So their their ability is to cut uh, on the human resource side. So it really does point to, you know, a, a really need for bold leadership at, at the local level and the national level to be able to try to, you know, if they don't have money to spend on programs, um, is how do you rapidly try to re-engineer your local economy, take advantage of some of the things I agree with that. I think on a national basis, places like Louisville will look much more attractive than a lot of the larger cities. How do, how do we take advantage of that? Well, I mean, you take some strong local it. leadership. What if the city can maybe lit some of this extra space, like the sidewalks and whatnot, like tax that at a high level and let that remain or let the traveling alcohol, you know, drinks tax those at a higher level and let that <laughs> remain, but just, yeah. There's these small things that um, I just saw an interesting quote about ripples. So you have this big ripple, uh, you know, from COVID-19, but if you try to touch it, it just creates more ripples. So sometimes the best thing you can do is just let it sit. So like maybe not print this money and then just deal with it now instead of like, you know, having to go out longer and longer. Guys, my dog's barking. Give me one second. I'll be right back. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I don't know how many of you all had a chance to look at the video that was uh, distributed along with Rob's uh, invitation, but, but you know, they kind of gave a graphical um, look at the the timing and sequence and impact from the, the COVID-19 situation. Um, and again, there's a million data points at that. I, I think that uh, that analogy was, was spot on in terms of the cycles of, of what's going to happen. The real question is, is how severe, you know, will that uh, economic impact be, and then how how will the federal government be able to finance a lot of the programs that they want to put in place to help mitigate these damages? Um, you know, I, I mean, I have some concern that they'll they'll have enough money. We're already seeing the pushback in Washington on the next level of stimulus bill, the three billion dollar package, and at the rate things are going, we'll we'll certainly need more than that, and. Um, you know, $3 trillion is, is an, an awful lot of money um, by anybody's standards. And uh, I think I did the calculations. I believe uh, a $2 trillion package is about $5,000 of debt for every single American. And so when you start talking about putting $3 trillion on, think about everybody just taking on another ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a year um, right now of additional indebtedness that we got to pay off on top of all the others. So big, a lot of big problems to solve on that front. Yeah. And then, um, Rob, did you get your dog squared away? Oh yeah. I, I knew leaving Frank outside was a bad idea. Like, but you know, I did it anyway. It took a few seconds. Um, yeah. And then you got, I mean, all, negatives, like are these public schools or, I mean, like you have all these private schools. I mean, all this disposable income, I mean, it's kind of vanishing. I, I don't know. I think it's going to be, I don't know, 
there's so many ripples. I, Chris McCarty and I had a great call with uh, John pretty recently, and we, we talked about a lot of that. Uh, okay, so it's okay if I start going into some of the stuff I found, and then none yeah. of this. Yeah. I want to have some discussion. I want to see comments. Um, okay, gosh, guys, the market's nuts. My phone is blowing up. Um, okay. So right now is a great time to uh, leverage your equity in order to purchase more. So I know Mike was talking about the video. I mean, right now, I know my good friend, Luke Neubauer, he just uh, refied on three of his deals. One, you're not, you're going to get crazy interest rates, but you're also just being able to have that money available if there is a good time to buy. I mean, some people are going to be over leveraged and they're going to need to sell and like might as well be able to solve their problem and, you know, benefit from it. Uh, uh, I read a lot of articles over the last two days to talk today. Um, so people are going to be begin to defaulting. So you want to be able to take advantage of that. Don't be going, don't go and buy new cars right now. I know there's, there's like four years, no interest on cars right now. They're just, they just need to get those assets out of their lots because there's a huge buildup behind them and they can't move what's already out there. Right. You buy a new car. I know it's going to be tempting. Um, after we're allowed, like the courts come back, divorces are going to go up a ton, which means people are going to need to liquidate their assets quite a bit, like quickly. And then of course, once the courts open up, you're going to see a lot of bankruptcies. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity to buy businesses and, you know, just brick and mortar houses. Um, also, if you're a realtor, you know, on a divorce, you get one sale and two buys potentially. So if you're a realtor, divorce, go, go talk to your divorce attorneys. Um, and then, yeah, bankruptcies is going to be doing the same thing. Um, specialization is going to become even more important moving forward. You're not like, it, it, once things become more scarce, I mean, any kind of advantage you can have, that's why data is the number one commodity in the world. So you're going to want to work with the experts. You're going to want to work with Mike Ballot, who's been around the block. Um, you're going to, you're going to want to work with experts that are going to be able to separate you from the pack. Um, and then I read articles about like, what they think, and that's, oh, and that's true for attorneys. You're going to want to work with investor-friendly attorneys in this regard, um, lenders, realtors. Uh, I don't know. When the market shifts, you're going to see just a lot of the fat coming up. You're going to lose a lot of title companies, lenders that, you know, were just kind of skimming by. A lot of these businesses that we're seeing going out of business right now, they were kind of on their way out anyway. And then the ones that are going to be shockers are going to be eight months, 12 months down the line. But there's, gosh, there's going to be so much opportunity here. Um, I mean, yeah, you, I'd just like to throw out on, on that, you know, we, we have not had an economic downturn for quite a while. And, you know, there, an economic downturn is just like a storm. It clears out a lot of the, 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 just like a storm clears out weaker trees, the economic downturns clear out a lot of businesses. So we've really had kind of a collection or aggregation of a lot of companies and businesses that were not super strong, but could thrive in an era of, you know, tremendous, uh, you know, wage growth and uh, liquidity in the market, low interest rates. And so a lot of companies have been able to survive, even though they may not be that strong of a company or their concept may not be good, that good. Their fundamentals not that good, but the market kind of propped them up. So a lot of those is that's a healthy part of capitalism is that uh, they, they, they fail and move on and uh, stronger companies come in and take their place or more innovative companies come in and take their place. So, you know, a lot of that stuff you know, is going to happen. Um, and the other thing I wanted to add just in the, for the, in the investor space, there has been a lot of, of movement and shakeout on just on the lender side um, because a lot of the, the funding that comes for many of the, what we'll call national lenders, those that have a more than a multi-state, you know, might have 10, 15, 20 state footprint, many of those get their money from the capital markets and those are, are run more as an investment than they are as, as a business. I would view ourselves and the other local private lenders here. That we're, we're in business. We, this is what we do. We have customers. We live in the community. Um, we have relationships. We run, we run our business versus the, some of the national lenders. It's more like a stock portfolio to them. If a, if a stock isn't performing and, and private lending is a stock in that they simply sell that and move on and invest in a different asset class. So a lot of the, uh, of that money is very portable and has moved out of the space. So if it's coming back at, at dramatically different terms, and, but what that means is that there is less available funding in the marketplace to investors, particularly at, at, at good terms and good prices. 
uh, which means that uh, for those that, that do have funding and do have relationships, it makes you more competitive. So down the road, that the other thing I think is going to happen is going to be fewer investors participating in the landscape because it's going to be a more challenging and difficult. It's going to require more operational skill, uh, better judgment, uh, higher financial qualifications, and the ability to pivot when the market changes rapidly. So, you know, we've kind of grown up for a lot of us in the last four or five years. Every trend line was an uptrend line, sales, um, prices, profits, everything was going up except for interest rates were going a little sideways and then down and inventory was going down. So all of those things gave a lot of headwinds or a lot of tailwinds to the, to the investors. And now we're going to see, we're going to get some, some, some headwinds and a lot of crosswinds are going to be hitting on that we're not don't know are they good for us or are they bad for us so what you know as as inventory drops for example and prices go up some 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 buyers just drop out of the market because they're priced out of the market and so they make other arrangements they get roommates or whatever and they're not actively in the market and so you so you lose some potential buyers there so um you know again a lot of money is not going to be in the market for, on the lender side and that means that there'll be fewer investors in the market. Oh, for sure. Back to you, Rob. Well, no, I, and I, guys, you got to think, think about how much our landscape locally is changing. I mean, Shelby Park prices up from 40,000 to 250, 240. I mean, Shively went from 50,000 to 150,000. So I think a cool thing, yeah, all right, you're seeing these changes in these communities. And a lot of that is because we have nowhere to build. I mean, like uh, someone mentioned, like, why, Mike, did you, I don't know if you saw this question. Someone asked, why is Indianapolis looking so bad relative to Louisville and Cincinnati? I answered him in the chat that I, they, have a more, they have more space to spread out in Indianapolis to build where we don't have new builds, so we, we have less inventory. I don't know. Why, why do you think Indianapolis is struggling relative to Cincinnati. Well, you know, actually, I mean, you know, the, the numbers, there was a couple of odd numbers in there. In, in those, the Indianapolis numbers cover, I think, 11 or 12 um, counties in Indy. Uh, the Louisville numbers are, are the greater ones that come from MLS, and Cincinnati was just the, the uh, Hamilton County market. So those numbers are not exactly comparable market to market, but that's, that's the, those are the numbers that we had. Indianapolis actually is a very uh, healthy number. They have, a, they have a really strong economy. And, uh, uh, you know, their, their prices are generally a little bit higher than uh, Louisville's. And uh, they churn through a lot of inventory, uh, you know, in that market. So uh, those numbers may have been a little misleading uh, on that front. I think all three of the, of the, of the markets, Louisville, Cincinnati, and Indianapolis, all perform r relatively the same. Um, I mean, in terms of the velocity of, of, uh, of buys and sells, um, the, the types of houses, uh, you know, I mean, we're seeing, and we're primarily in the median house price range, which has, has increased in value, but it's the, it's the three, two, three, one house that, uh, you know, between, I guess, a hundred thousand to 300,000, that's over 70% of the total sales. So, um, it, that space is doing great. The upper price homes in Indianapolis above 300,000 generally do very well. Cincinnati does pretty good. Louisville's probably at the, at the bottom of the pack in that area. See if I can. I can't see those questions on my. I, I, we don't have it actually. Anything else? And oh. I'm so ADD. Okay. So my mind is literally just bouncing around. Um, one. So I think what's cool is you have those areas that are turning Shelby Park, Shiloh, whatnot. I think you're going to see the commercial end. Like you're going to see some of these businesses die over there, like the J.C. Penneys, the Sears, etc. But I think though that's going to be an opportunity for like the Chipotle's to come in there, the Chipotle's. Like there's going to be a lot of money being able to pour the companies that are healthy. They're going to be able to pour money into these areas and, uh, you know, McDonald's, you know, they, 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 that they aren't in the burger business or in the real estate business. Well, they're going to be able to get some assets that are like dinosaurs that have died away and be able to put new things there, get, get the oil, if you will. Uh, that's funny in my head. Right. Um, so what should be really cool. And um, uh, Frank Miller actually said something yesterday, which is really something to be in, cognitive of. Well, prices are going up because demand's really high right now. Interest rates are really low and inventory is really low. Um, Frank said that he had his GC go to uh, like Lowe's or Home Depot and they were out of light switches. So we're going to start seeing the effects of not being able to do shipping with China and they weren't able to manufacture because of their shutdown. Mm -hmm. so it increases 
and all those manufacturing things. And we're not even at inflation yet. So it's, guys, there's ripples coming, but it's, I don't know, it's cool that, I mean, like, think about it. Frank helped us identify that it ha it's, it's something that's happening and something to be cognitive of. And now we're tooled to start planning ahead. All right, I've got a flip. Maybe I'll just order you switches ahead of time. You know, it, guys, there's so much value in talking and discussing. I don't know. I'm, I'm glad you're all here today. Um, yeah. And I thought Matt points up, I mean, as we, as we were talking about earlier, that, uh, you know, going forward, experience will matter a lot. And the ability to manage, you know, that doesn't sound like it's a critical thing for, for over the last five years, being able to buy light switches. But if that's going to hold you up for a month or two months on, on finishing and selling a house, it is a big deal. And, and so there'll be many, many unintended consequences, you know, that, that, that get populated out through this pandemic that if you, if you don't have the wherewithal to work through those problems and solve them, they'll have significant impacts on, on your business. So, you know, for all of the folks that we've been dealing with, you know, we're, we're telling them to, you know, expect lower values, even though we're not seeing them right now. But be prepared for them, expect them, uh, and you know, longer days on market will come at some point. I mean, we're 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 really the the market is just cooking right now in that regard. But we got to believe that that's going to change. And if you're not prepared for that change, and you don't have the capital for it or the structure for it, then you become a casualty of it. Mike, how much are you expecting on uh, values going down? It, I've heard people say five percent to ten percent. Where are you on the? We're, we're in that we're in that range, you know. Really, the every day that goes by that there is not, you know, more po significant positive news, which I would consider significant positive news, meaning that there is some form of of a visible end to the pandemic, either you know strong therapeutics or a vaccine, um, you know, because we're gonna we are gonna be handicapped until we get to that point, or we or we get absolute herd immunity and it's not an issue, but you know. That, that's a, that's a longer term process. I know Louisville right now is is trying to figure out through some uh, antibiotic testing how how much we what kind of uh, of rate we've had of infection, kind of where we're on that. The numbers I've seen, you know, are we're we're at very low levels. It's a, and so so the the um, the impact on the economy, which will which will affect housing, it's going to be around for a while until we see some positive signs. So when we start to see some positive signs. We'll start to maybe neutralize and say, well, maybe maybe we don't need to be as 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 grim about that. But we're looking at five to ten percent. We started kind of at five, and we're marching towards ten in general on median price houses. If it's something that's a little outside that box, we're going to probably take a little grimmer view of it um, and say that you know it's not quite as attractive. And and we want uh, basically anything that we're financing right now to have a minimum of two exit strategies, either. Uh, you know, flip or rent, and it could be a turnkey rental or it could be, uh, you know, a rental that you're going to hold, but that, you know, as we're looking at the, uh, over on the screen here, the, the mortgage credit availability, that if if that starts to slow down and it starts to slow sales, that, you know, the, the good thing about single family houses is they have multiple ways that they can be a productive asset. There's not only one, one way that they can be productive. And with the lack of supply and the shortage that's out there is that the rental is always a good option and keep, you know, always want to keep cash flow going. Well, it's, oh, shoot, I had something for you. Uh, Mike, I might be putting you on the spot here because I haven't done any research on it, but generally, People have had negative opinion about the CARES Act in regards to tenants. But I hear from my CPA that you're able to write off a lot more of your renovations and whatnot due to the CARES Act. Like there's some things you're able to write off because they want you spending money to spurn the economy. Have you heard anything like that? Do you have any thoughts about the CARES Act? Uh, you know, I really, I, I really haven't spent a lot of uh, time and energy digging into that. So, uh, you know, I, I really don't know. Um, we can save that for you know, what kind of, yeah, yeah, you know, with the, the, the tax incentives. Um, so, yeah, but I mean, I think right now everybody's just focused on trying to stabilize. We can stabilize. I don't think that the unemployment numbers are a real accurate gauge of what's happening out there because many of those are temporary furloughs. People are going, you know, people are going back to work. And so you see some net numbers, people are leaving, people are going back, some of the big manufacturers um, and, and the unemployment benefits are so attractive right now that we don't really have a true normal test of what that's going to look like. So 
because um, if those if those numbers held, it, it would be catastrophic. Was it we can't we can't sustain that for unemployment right now? Twenty six million. I think yeah, all, over thirty million, thirty two million. Wow, and then and it does that. That includes, I don't know how they calculate how they calculate gig workers and uh, self-employed in those numbers because they've made a lot of exceptions for it. So, again, it, it's kind of hard to get a, a handle, but those numbers anywhere near that, uh, there's 350 million people in the United States. So, you know, that's 10 percent of everybody is yeah. unemployed. And so if it's half the people are working, that's a that's a big number that aren't aren't being able to produce income. But that'll be that'll recede. I mean, in my mind, at least. 50%, I think, once things get back to rolling. But I don't know. Do you think that's a realistic number to get get it from 35 to, what is that, 17 in a five, 17 and a half? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it increased rapidly. Uh, it'll never go down as rapidly as it went up. Um, it's always harder to restart. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to, to go in and, and shut, but it's, it's harder to open. And the longer that things stay closed, the longer it takes to, to reopen. And uh, we'll find out some, some places just won't reopen at all, uh, you know, particularly on, the, on the, you know, the restaurant and the service industry side. And I'm an idiot, but I, if I heard correctly in the video, 2008 and whatnot, it was like 2 million in unemployment, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, was, the, yeah. the order of magnitude is significant. But again, you know, a lot of this is just people had to quit their, 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 their these are, um, you know, temporary measures that were put in place. And, you know, but once that damage to the economy is done, um, you know, if, uh, you know, if, a, if you're a restaurant owner and you're closed for uh, 60 to 90 days and you can open up at a third capacity and you're really not making money at a third capacity and you have to do that for six months, nine months, a year, two years, at what point do you say, well, I don't, ha I can't, I, I'm not making any money out of my business and I can't sustain this, so I'm gonna. I'm just gonna quit. So that's that's the path. And we don't know what those numbers. Are. I think I, I'm an optimist by nature, so you know I'm hopeful that um, uh, you know it, it'll be short lived and, and and you know the impacts won't be as great. But I don't think all the numbers really support that. But um, you know that's why I think we really have to be realistic and assume there's going to be more damage. We'll see some drops in values, and we'll see a lot of failures in companies. And guys, there's going to be some more blows coming ahead. Uh, insult to injury. I mean, we've, and this is just natural for every year. But guys, we're coming into hurricane season. And you know what's going to happen? The South's going to get hit in Texas and Florida. And then we're going to lose a lot of our labor force. So if you have a good crew, lock them in with projects. Don't, don't give them a reason to leave and work somewhere else. Because we're, that happened when we had the, what, what was it? Harvey and I don't remember the other one. We had one in Florida and one in Texas. And our labor shortage yeah. built a lot of people's flips and turn time and plumbing and electrical. and Yeah, it was bad. So just plan for that. I mean, I heard there was some, uh, an article that's saying this might be our worst hurricane season yet. And who can know for certain, but just something to be cognitive of. <laughs> Not all doom and gloom. There's there can be so much opportunity out there, guys. Um, yeah. Th like, these are the lowest interest rates we've ever seen, right? Yeah, I think on the um, on the mortgage rates, they're at the lowest level that they've been in in recent history. So, you know, there's a lot of re if if if, you, if buyers are out there and they have credit and income, it's a great time to buy a house. And I think that's why we're seeing some of the pent up demand coming. There's probably a lot of people that have been in the market for a while who see it, an opportunity now to to come in. And, and, and buy something that they couldn't have bought last year. They might've been, you know, multiple offers or competing for it. So they maybe get it at, at a little more price, but after uh, mortgage payments, they're, they're actually getting a little bit of a discount. So, you know, you know, I think over the, you know, we're looking, if, if somebody's buying something right now and they're going to fix it up and flip it, or, or even if they're going to rent it and they've got a four to, to six month lead time to that, you know, you're looking into the into into the fall period, late fall, maybe even you know, kind of Christmas time, and so kind of think about what's it going to look like then if we if the if there is a vaccine that's announced. I think 
you know, things will things will change very rapidly if that happens, because it means that there is a definite end in sight. If if we see, which I think we will, that there's therapeutics that will mitigate a lot of the damage, I think that allows us to open up even more. So, uh, but if we don't, then you know we could face you know pretty uh, dim prospects in the fall. So again, investors just have to be ready. We don't know, we don't know what's going to happen at that point. Um, and we know that we're already going to have a lot of economic carnage from where we just to get to where we are right now. And so, uh, again, investors just are, are well advised uh, to to check a little bit of their optimism and make sure that they're doing correct valuations, uh, having some liquidity and not betting the ranch on all, all the great deals that are out there right now that um, that they're, they're being very, me- very measured in their investment process. Uh Yes. And so it's, it's guys, we're going to be fine. We've got, and, and one thing, and I, I want to encourage everyone today's the 22nd. It was originally the 25th, but now you're allowed to hang out in groups of 10 or less. So I know Korea not going to be able to get everybody together in these big groups. Um, mm-hmm. You guys have so many resources. You have so many people that have similar interests to you. So guys, if you're going on a walk at Seneca park to walk your dogs, post in the Korea group, Hey guys, I'm going on a walk in Seneca park. I'd love to talk real estate. I'll be there at 9 p.m. by the playground. And you know what? Maybe three or four people show up. Maybe you don't have anybody. You're still going to go on a walk anyway. But start creating these reasons to uh, share. Like I'm starting a breakfast club. I'm starting a poker club. I'm starting, starting a bike club. I might even start a cribbage euchre club. Who knows? But just create reasons to hang out, connect. Um, I know uh, Mike is our only platinum sponsor. And I think Mike would love to start having these little smaller groups get together and um, we all have office space. We all have parks. We, there's plenty of places we can all meet. I know Ed Gibson is still planning on doing his uh, Tuesday at Napa Valley. Uh, I, I know it's going to be outdoors. It'll be interesting. Bring your own lunch. I have no idea. Mike's or Ed's putting that together. It was his birthday yesterday. Happy birthday. Luke Harwell's birthday today. Happy birthday, Luke. Uh, but create excuses to hang out with everybody. Um, so I am about to say some stuff that's a little bit Leary, as me being a realtor, so I'm just going to state it as facts. But I read an article today on Bigger Pockets that some of the best cities to invest are cities that do not have, well, that have significant income gaps. Like San Francisco was number one. So apparently, the cities that have the larger income gaps, properties are appreciating at a higher level. So Louisville, I mean, we've been getting some crazy appreciation, like 7,500 to to 10,000 a year. And um, I'm reading that a lot of people are um, equity rich, cash poor right now as well. So right now, maybe if you have a bunch of properties, refinance out and be able to get more properties because our, our appreciation is gonna go up. There's nowhere to build in Louisville. I mean, take advantage of our market, guys. That's why people invest from California, New York City. They put their, market, their money here in Cincinnati and Indianapolis because it's safe. You live here. Take advantage of it. What are your thoughts, Mike? Yeah, well, I agree. I mean, you know, the um, the uh, migration of uh, of investment from you know east and west coast to the to the Midwest is is increasing, particularly as a result of what's what's been happening because we are viewed as a safe haven in 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 the, in the single family asset class because uh, you know good good solid economies, uh, solid rent rolls, uh, good workforce, you know particularly like if you get into Indiana, very solid, you know, state governments. Uh, so, um, you know, def- definitely a time to have, you know, cash and liquidity and to be very measured in looking at your investments and to, then, then to watch the trends and just see what's happening. Because once you buy a house, you're, you're committed. You're, you're going to have to finish the rehab and deal with it one way or the other. You know, it's kind of like you, you're going on vacation and a hurricane is coming that way. We turn around when you buy a house. So, you know, you can't, you've, you've already bought it and you're, you're going to be, you know, you may be selling it in a, in a bad climate. Yep. Um, guys, I guess we're getting close to wrapping up. Does anybody have any questions for Mike Fallett, the single platinum in, <laughs> platinum uh, lender at Korea? Um, he, he hasn't been able to get in front of you guys as much with the, uh, the lots. We have been talking about doing a virtual lots. Uh, hasn't come to fruition yet, but we, we might do it. Uh, but um, any more questions, guys? And then here's the deal. Mike will tell you this too. If you are looking at a deal, have Mike 
put eyes on it. Have me, I'm happy to put eyes on it. Just to make sure you're getting in a good deal because there's nothing worse than buying at the wrong number. Um, let's see. Well, I don't, I don't see any questions. Guys, we'll be here next Friday. I'm going to start lining up all the presents. Do you have any closing thoughts, Mike? No, thanks to everybody for, for being here today. And, and um, you know, it, this, this is a great time to be a member of ARIA for the, the ability to share information and get insight. Nobody has a perfect view of what's going to happen, uh, but there's lots of, of, of data points that you can get particularly from the local, you can, you know, the, the, on the national level, you can get all kinds of stuff that doesn't mean a lot, but at, at a local level, the, the CREA and the local groups are really terrific for being able to share, get information, give you a little uh, support or whatever. If we can, if we can do that for you, call me, call Wendy, we're happy to do that. And I uh, want to express our appreciation to uh, CREA and all of the officers and board members. I know they've been working hard to, to adapt to the new circumstances. And, and again, but uh, um, Rob, I, I don't know what your pay and pension is that you get through Korea. I think it's pretty substantial, uh, but most of them don't, don't get the compensation that Rob gets from Korea. But they, they do all this on their own time, on their own nickel. So thanks for all that you guys do. Well, thanks for that. For the record, they don't pay me anything. <laughs> I'll see oh, you. I was confused yeah. on that. <laughs> <laughs> Leverage, right? All right. See you yeah. guys. Take care. Have a great day. Enjoy this weather. Enjoy your long weekend. Thanks, everybody. Guys, take care.